Hello, my name is Sarah Bellion, and I'm the curator here at the Pacific Fleet Submarine Museum at Pearl Harbor, home of the USS Bowfin, a World War II fleet submarine. Now, we have been tasked recently by our neighbors, the National Park Service, with sharing some of our lesser known World War II stories, and that's what we'd like to do for you today. While we're reporting, if you hear some banging in the background, that's because we're under renovation, and we've been rebuilding our facilities and designing new exhibits, this process started last year in January, and we're hopeful to be able to reopen our museum to the public in early 2021. So I've done the best I can to try to keep the banging and the crashing to a minimum, but it's just normal noise around here. Um, renovations can be quite loud, um, but we are really excited to be able to share with all of our visitors what we've been working on. It's going to be fantastic. So one of the defining characteristics of the silent service is that in order for submarines to be successful, it's absolutely imperative that no one knows where they are or what they're doing. And this is just as true today as it was in World War II. For this reason, the contributions of submarines are often overlooked. Though in World War II, their primary purpose was to sink Japanese shipping and warships, submarines also carried out numerous covert operations, some of which remained secret long after the end of the war. The defense of the Philippines from December 1941 to April of 1942 was the first major challenge to American supply lines. It was extremely difficult to get basic food and ammunition to the forces holding off the Japanese there. For MacArthur, this solution was to reward anyone who was able to run the blockade, regardless of whether these were Navy crews or civilian smugglers. But almost no one could get through. Still, there was a need to remove uh, MacArthur himself, although he chose to evacuate by PT boat, pilots, members of a top secret radio intelligence unit, other key officials before the Japanese could capture them, as well as American uh, nurses and military dependents. And this is where our submarines came into play. Since there was a great demand for all of these things to be brought out of the Philippines to have all of these evacuations take place, it made sense that we could load food and ammunition onto the submarines to make the trip in and deliver these much needed supplies to the, the guerrillas. So the submarines start to serve a twofold purpose. One, they're helping things get out of the Philippines. And on the other hand, they're bringing supplies to the Philippines that are necessary to keep fighting the Japanese. Between January 1st, 1943 and New Year's Day of 1945, 18 submarines carried out 30 special missions in the Philippines, including Bofin. During these missions, over a thousand tons of supplies and equipment were landed and delivered, sometimes 60 to 70 tons at a time. Now, submarines are not designed to carry this amount of cargo, so supplies were put in the ballast tanks, they were loaded and unloaded by hand. The submarines that did these deliveries, some of them were actually even modified where their torpedo loading gear was removed. So you only had the fish that were in the tubes and then you were out, no more torpedoes, you couldn't load more. Um, but that's because the nature of the missions that they were doing. When you have to load a submarine with lots of cargo, there's only one way to do it. And that's the hand carry and pass from man to man, your ammunition, your food supplies down the hatch. Now, when this is your method of loading, there's no other way to get supplies on or off. This takes a lot of time and these human chains unloading or loading something really makes the submarine a sitting duck. And so it was quite risky business to be delivering supplies to the Philippines because they had to do this all by hand. Um, they also had to do it under cover of darkness because as soon as they were detected, this, this mission is no longer a success. You have to do it in absolute secrecy. Um, in some cases, it was necessary also for the submarines after delivering supplies to replace the weight in their ballast tanks so that they could submerge and surface without any kind of problems. It's like you load this down very heavily, very specifically, and then you change the balance of where objects are and now your submarine's weight is, is inconsistent and now you cannot submerge or resurface without problems. In some cases, this was things like Bofin picked up a 
bunch of coconuts and bananas and other fruit and produce, which is very valuable to submariners who are eating, you know, preserved things day after day, fresh fruit, good source of vitamins, make sure you don't get your scurvy. <laughs> Famous story is that USS Trout traded all of her ammunition for over 20 tons of gold and silver from the Philippine treasury. So they wanted to keep this out of the Japanese, but um, they were filling every available space on that submarine with gold bricks. <laughs> So our submarine, USS Bowfin, undertook one such mission for which she received the Philippine Republic Presidential Unit Citation. Around September 20th, 1943, she delivered supplies, mail, and money to the Philippines. In addition to this, the crew voluntarily contributed cigarettes, clothing, and anything else that could be spared. Bowfin also evacuated nine people, including Samuel C. Gracio, a fighter pilot, who survived not only the loss of his plane, but also the Bataan death march and confinement in three different POW camps. When he escaped his third prison colony, he joined up with the guerrillas to continue fighting. Gracio became lifelong friends with several Bofin crew members. Then on the 4th of April of 1943, there were 10 of us Americans and two Filipinos that escaped the Malapino colony and we joined the guerrilla forces and I served with them until the 29th of September of 1943 and that's the time when the Bofin picked me up off the north, north, north central coast of Mindanao. The message went out that there were 10 Americans who had escaped from the, the Malapino colony and they had very vital information concerning prisoners of war who were captured on Bataan and Crigador and they shortly thereafter they uh, they uh, sent a submarine out and picked up three of our escapees. One was Commander McCoy, Melvin H. McCoy, who was a Annapolis graduate, and uh, Steve Melanick, who was a West Point graduate, and my squadron commander, Ed Dias, and they named Dias Air Force Base after him in Abilene, Texas. And then it was on the, it was shortly after that is when the, the Bofin came in and picked me up. Can you tell some of the highlights of your around 10 days time on the Bofin as the Bofin moved from Mindanao to Fremont Harbor? Well, I'd say it was probably the most exciting experience of my whole lifetime. I can honestly say that that group of men who composed the crew of the Bofin were uh, the finest men that I ever met in my whole life. I, they were just beautiful people. The thing that really impressed me was the time when we sunk the first ship. The klaxon horn went off. And these men manned their battle stations. You, you could just see organization and, 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 and dedication. They, they knew what they were doing, and, and they did it. They sunk the ship off of, uh, between Borneo and Zamboango. I believe it was a combination troop transport and cargo ship. And then they got another ship in the Indian Ocean, which I believe was a, was a uh, communications vessel. And finally, we arrived in Fremantle, Australia. And they put me in a hospital there, and um, I believe it was the second night that I was in the hospital, several of the crew of the Bofin came up to see me. And that was a very, in fact, it brought tears to my eyes to think that here are men that have been out on patrol for two months and they would take time enough to come and see me in the hospital. I just, I'll never forget that. Now, submarines are crowded with only their officers and crew on board. A fleet submarine like Bofin is only 311 feet long would generally carry at least 70 enlisted men and 10 officers. So the bunks are shared among the enlisted men um, and they sleep in shifts and this is called hot racking. So as you can imagine, if the submarine has to go and pick up these uh, refugees or these VIPs that need to be evacuated from the Philippines, where are you gonna put all these people? If there's only 10 or so, this can be kind of managed, but sometimes subs had to rescue far more people than they were prepared for. On March 20th, 1944, the USS Angler took on 58 refugees. So this is a, a, a crazy number of people on an already very crowded boat. And these refugees included children. Uh, Louise Spencer, who's got a really interesting account of her time on Angler. She was eight months pregnant on the time and had been on the run for two years. And a 13 year old girl who at the time had 104 degree fever and they described her as at death's door. So 
This is a very challenging situation, as you might imagine. Angler's pharmacist's mate was able to treat the girl, but this is the closest thing they have to a doctor on board a submarine as a pharmacist's mate. Uh, the refugees that they picked up, 58 people, also, again, had been on the run from the Japanese for quite some time. They had bad digestive issues, which submarine toilets are not equipped for. Uh, they had panic attacks, probably a lot of them had PTSD, and they were badly infested with lice. So this, as you can imagine, made the already uncomfortable quarters aboard Angler just even more uncomfortable, like massively uncomfortable. But the submariners, uh, according to Spencer's account, they, they didn't complain. And they did everything they could to treat everyone who was sick or injured. And they provided the malnourished children with the best food that they could stomach. Mostly rice was what they could handle eating. And Angler completely ran out of rice and a lot of other things before a surface ship could actually take the refugees to safety. So not only were these men willing to risk considerably by taking these secret missions on, but they were also willing to endure a lot of, of really rough conditions, far, far nastier than aboard most World War II ships uh, in an effort to save these people that desperately needed their help. Now, one of the people who was rescued by Angler was 15-year-old Mary Sevilla. Uh, her family had been on the run for four years at the time. Her father had been killed, her grandmother had been killed, and her mother kept four children together, moving from one encampment to the next. Now, uh, the guerrillas realized this family was just not in good shape, and they helped guide them to the coast, and they put them in canoes. And uh, as Sevilla describes it, suddenly a submarine surfaced right next to us, Seeing your sub come to the surface was the happiest and most thrilling moment of my life. So um, we actually have another account of a young person who was rescued by a submarine. USS Swordfish was assigned to take the president of the Philippines and his family and several important army officers from the Philippines to Australia. And the president's young son, Manuel L. Quezon Jr., recalled his family's rescue. This is what he wrote. On the 19th of February, 1942, at midnight that night, we boarded the submarine Swordfish. After a good night's sleep, there was an alarming sound of a siren, a signal that we were submerging. On the surface, the sub had moved like the waves, like any other ship. The moment we were submerged, the sub became almost completely motionless. I must be one of the very few people who ever received communion underwater. Commander Smith had decided to attack Japanese troop shifts in Subic before picking us up. Most irresponsible, really. And naturally, the Japanese dropped depth charges. As a result, half the air conditioning system did not work, and it was hot as hell. There were a lot of red lights, meaning no smoking, but the sailors were merrily smoking away. At one time, there seemed to be sound of propellers, which was alarming, possibly an enemy warship but it turned out to be the movement of fishtails. Then we approached the shore. I seem to recall there was some problem with identifying the people signaling from a boat to pick us up. If only the people on the boat had realized how close they came to being sunk, but finally we were put ashore. I recall distinctly leaning my head and shoulders against my father's dark brown leather jacket in relaxation, feeling safe. I did not realize we were in danger all the time. In two years, Bofin and her sister subs would land 331 men, mostly military advisors and specialists, um, and they would rescue nearly 500 evacuees, uh, missionaries, um, political leaders, expatriates, nurses, army dependents. Um, the Japanese took over 60,000 prisoners in the Philippines, but anyone who was an American or was believed to be in cooperation with the Americans was in a very special kind of danger. And uh, the Japanese had, fairly early on, a lot of people weren't even aware of this, had issued a kill order for any Americans that were found in the Philippines. And this included missionaries, uh, even, in, even their children. Uh, so in Louise Spencer's account from her rescue by Angler, she says that her and her husband found out after they ran into the hills that about a year later, some friends of theirs who were missionaries were they were killed, including their son, who was only 12. So 
although it was very uncomfortable and probably very scary to be rescued by a submarine, it was, in some cases, the only way that these people were going to survive. The first submarine supply mission to the Philippines occurred in January of 1943. Gudgeon, SS-211, unloaded equipment for the Coast Watcher units and also landed six agents in the central Philippines, led by Captain Jesus Villamor. The unit's task was to set up a communications network that could radio intelligence back to MacArthur. Villamor discovered a large guerrilla organization in desperate need of supplies and ammunition. USS Tambor delivered them 70,000 rounds and $10,000 in cash. From then on, a submarine would deliver an additional two tons of supplies about once a month. Like Gudgeon, Tambor was also carrying a group of agents led by Lieutenant Commander Charles Chick Parsons. Before the war, Parsons had been a stevedore in Manila, and he had extensive knowledge of the local waterways. At this time, the Navy had been reluctant to commit a boat full-time to the Philippine guerrilla campaign, but Parsons' report changed their minds about the value of supporting the guerrillas. USS Narwhal was made available for the job, including the removal of all of her torpedo handling equipment to make room for cargo. Narwhal delivered two Army radio intelligence teams and 92 tons of cargo, weapons, medicine, clothing, essential equipment, cigarettes, and food, including chocolate bars with labels that read, I shall return, MacArthur. The evacuation of civilians from the Philippines and the delivery of military advisors and supplies became so routine it was actually used on one occasion as a ruse. USS Crevel was charged with evacuating 40 people, including missionaries and escaped POWs. However, the guerrillas at this time had also come into possession of a briefcase full of top-secret Japanese Navy papers. This turned out to be the Z Operations Order, a strategic battle plan for the defense of the Western Pacific, which helped the Americans to gain the advantage in the Battle of the Philippine Sea. By the end of the war, about 15% of all submarine patrols were either wholly special operations or had a special operations component. Early efforts by submarines to land combat swimmers on beaches using two-man motorized rafts dubbed flying mattresses by the Office of Strategic Services pioneered intelligence gathering techniques and commando style tactics used by today's special forces. The Office of Strategic Services was the precursor to the CIA. So all of this work with these combat swimmers being deployed from submarines really leads to the creation of the Navy SEALs in the 1960s. So lifeguard missions weren't just isolated to the Philippines. In addition to picking up and evacuating people from the islands, submarines were also charged with rescuing downed aviators, and in, on one occasion, um, they successfully rescued the entire crew of a Dutch submarine, O-19. So this was USS Cod. So initially, Cod tried to tow the boat off a reef, but when their efforts failed, they had to offload everything they could and then destroy it so it wouldn't fall into Japanese hands. So Cod's crew discovered uh, that the Dutch, unlike the Americans, actually carried a lot of liquor on board. And this uh, cocktail party is commemorated with a martini glass on the battle flag of USS Cod. So <laughs> some of the boats have Japanese flags, some of the boats have mines, some of the boats have uh, Bofin's battle flag has a bus and a crane and a dock. Barb's battle flag has a train on it, and Cod's battle flag has a martini glass. <laughs> so, um, on the subject of downed aviators, so submarines regularly rescued aviators. Um, and in one case, the, uh, one of the airmen, famously rescued by USS Finback, uh, later became president of the United States, and that was uh, George H.W. Bush. So, um, all these young guys that were all these, these, these young pilots getting picked up by the submarines, um, you never really, uh, never really know where they're going to go.